Well, tonight we're going to finish up the God Our Ebenezer, as I've called it. And if you remember last time, we looked at a little bit of the background leading up to 2 Samuel 7, how Israel had gone to battle against the Philistines and got was beaten and then they decided to take the ark with them and the ark gets taken and it's in the land of the Philistines for several months and they end up getting hemorrhoids and, and send the thing back and so then Israel is um, mourning over their loss and they get the ark back and they go to Samuel and they are looking for some um, help from the Lord and Samuel tells them there that if they will put away their strange gods and turn their hearts to God, if they will put away Ashtaroth and Balaam and turn to the God only, then he would um, deliver them out of the hands of the Philistines. And that's where we left off in verse 3. And we saw something very interesting. I think it was very interesting. I think most of you did too. That Ashtoreth is the goddess of fertility which would be basically like Ishtar or Astarte or the Queen of Heaven, um, which is what the whole Easter celebration is about. And Balaam is the plural of Baal, and Baal is the sun god. And we know that Christmas is about is taken from a pagan holiday, which was called Natalis Solus Invicti, which was the birthday of the unconquered sun. So Christmas is sun worship, worshiping the the sun dying in the end of the year there in December and then coming back to life. So it appears as the days start to get longer. And Easter is the worship of the spring goddesses bringing about fertility to the earth. And so this is basically what Israel was doing way back then. They were, in in a sense, celebrating Christmas and Easter. And what Samuel tells them is, that, is if they're going to be delivered out of the hands of their enemies, they're going to have to put away these pagan holidays, these pagan worship things that they're doing. And the same thing would be true, and we were sort of talking about that after the Bible study last week, is that if Americans, if we are ever going to be saved from our enemies, right. it's only going to be by putting away Balaam That's and right. Ashtaroth. That's right. You know, it's going to be by stopping mixing and mingling paganism with Christianity and worshiping the Lord and serving the Lord only. So, you know, it, it's, and I think maybe you mentioned this, that, Look at what happened to Israel. They were losing their, their military battles, and they were taken into captivity, and then look what's happened to us. And really, in this country, you know, it was illegal back in sixteen in the early 1600s in the, was it Boston? I think it was the city of Boston. There were laws on the books which made it illegal to celebrate Christmas mm-hmm. back then. Right. So the Puritans didn't do it, and it, it really didn't take, a whole, take uh, effect until, or take, large popularity until the 1800s and that's when it became a national holiday and so on so we had a free country up until right around that time whenever the whole country starts going after Baal basically and there's a whole bunch of other factors in there and a whole bunch of other things but anyway it's interesting and then all of a sudden we start losing our wars and we haven't won a war since World War II and um, and we lost some prior to that too I guess we lost the civil war (laughs) depending on who you you want to say we the uh the the ones that were uh, aggressed upon anyway (laughs) the southern states certainly lost it but but no Vietnam Korea Vietnam uh the whole Iraq war over the both Iraq wars and uh, Afghanistan and all all the adventures that we're in now we basically we haven't won a war in in many many decades Mm -hmm. so why is that well because we haven't put away Balaam and Ashtoreth yet. That's right. So that takes us to verse 5 of 1 Samuel 7 and verse 5. It says, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpeh, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. So Samuel is going to pray for them. And if you look back through the Bible, you'll find several instances where you, it were, if you have a godly man praying for you, that God hears those prayers on his behalf and helps you out. Mm-hmm. Uh, one of those instances was in the book of Job, in Job 42, yep. 8 through 10. If you remember what happened to Job, the Lord put him through a test and allowed Satan to take everything from him, his family and his livelihood and even his health. And then um, Job's friends, so-called, come by and uh, basically accuse him of everything under the sun. 
And many of the things that they said were true, but they weren't really true about Job. They were pretty much wrong about Job entirely. But there is a lot of really good stuff in, in the book of Job. What they have to say about the wicked is very true, but they had just misapplied it was the issue. So after they all have their say, then God decides he's going to have his say with Job. And because Job had gotten a little bit too big for his britches at this point, and then Job starts to wax a little bit proud and thinking that he hadn't done anything to deserve any of this. And then the Lord has a little talk with him, and, and the Lord you know, asks him, well, where were you when I laid the foundations of the world? Where were you when I created all this stuff? And so he makes Job see just how utterly sinful he was, even though it says he was an upright man, but he's still, Job is still a man just like the rest of us. And Job says there in Job 42 and verse 6, Wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. So the Lord got his point across. Well then, the Lord tells Job to pray for these friends of his, because the Lord was not happy. We'll read verse 7. The Lord was not happy with these friends. It says, And it was so that after the Lord had spoken these words unto Job, the Lord said to Eliphaz, the Temanite, My wrath is kindled against thee and against thy two friends, for ye have not spoken of, of me the thing that is right, as my servant Job hath. Therefore take unto you now seven bullocks and seven rams, and go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourselves a burnt offering. And my servant Job shall pray for you, for him will I accept." lest I deal with you after your folly, in that ye have not spoken of me the thing which is right, like my servant Job. So Eliphaz the Temanite, and Bildad the Shuhite, and Zophar the Naamathite, went and did according as the Lord commanded them, and the Lord also accepted Job. And the Lord turned the captivity of Job when he prayed for his friends. Also the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. And this is what James is talking about when he said that you've heard of the patience of Job and you've seen the end of the Lord. Right here is the end of the story. Job gets back twice everything that he had lost. He didn't get it back. I guess he never really lost his wife, so he, got, he, he didn't get twice as many kids. He got the same amount of kids, got to keep the old wife that told him to curse God and die. But he got twice as much uh, stuff anyway back. So you see there, though, that the Lord accepted Job's prayer on their behalf. This is what's going to happen with Israel. Whenever they go to a good and godly man like Samuel, and Samuel prays for them, the Lord is going to hear Samuel's prayer. That's right. And the reason is also found in the book of James, in James 5.16, where we're told that the effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. James 5 and verse 16 says, Confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that you may be healed, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. And then he gives an example of that. Verse 17, Elias, that's Elijah, was a man subject to like passions as we are, and he prayed earnestly that it might not rain, and it rained not on the earth by the space of three years and six months. And he prayed again, and the heaven gave rain, and the earth brought forth her fruit. So talk about the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availing much. He prays to God and it doesn't rain for three and a half years. And then he prays to God again and it rains again. So that that is a, a prime example of a effectual fervent prayer if I've ever seen one. So let's go back to 1 Samuel 7 and verse 6. You know, sometimes whenever people are going through hard times or something and, and you, you have a notion to say, well, I wish I could do for, more for you, but you know, I'll just pray for you. That's all I can do. Well, that's probably about the best thing you can do. That's right. Considering, as if you're a righteous man, I guess, if you're a reprobate, it's, you're probably not going to get really past the, your cranium. But anyway, if you're a righteous man, that's a, a very effectual thing to do with the Lord. First Samuel 7 and verse 5. It says, And Samuel said, Gather all Israel to Mizpeh, and I will pray for you unto the Lord. I wanted verse 6. I already read verse 5. And they gathered together to Mizpeh, and drew water, and poured it out before the Lord, and fasted on that day, and said there, We have sinned against the Lord. And Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpeh. So you see here, Israel ends up humbling themselves, and they fast, 
and they confess their sins to God. So it's not just simply a matter of them doing what they've always done and saying, hey, Samuel, pray for us. Let's, yeah. let's just get out of this captivity. Right. They did their part as well. Right. We're told that in the book of James, again, that if we humble ourselves, that God will lift us up. And this is exactly what they're doing. Humbling themselves, they're pouring out this sacrifice, this water to God, and then they're fasting and confessing their sins. James 4, 8 through 10. James 4, 8 through 10. Draw nigh to God, and he will draw nigh to you. That's what Israel was doing there. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. That's exactly what they were doing. They were confessing their sins. They were turning from their wicked ways. Be afflicted and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to heaviness in your joy, or be turned to mourning in your joy to heaviness. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he shall lift you up. And that is a good description of what's about ready to happen. They humble themselves, and as we will see, the Lord lifts them up and helps them. Pastor? Yes. Is there any um, I, I, water offering? I don't know. Is, there, is that Moses' law, or is there any reference to pouring water out? The only thing I can think of offhand is when David was um, in the battle, I don't remember who he was fighting against, but he really wanted some water. And the three mighty men broke through yes. the ranks, went into the well and brought him the water, and he yeah. poured it out, and he said, this is the blood of those men. Yes. So it was kind of a sign of, of him, a, a sort of, of a sacrifice, you could say, in, in some way. Now, it wasn't to the Lord, but um, he was basically pouring out something valuable to him, mm. you know, in that sign. So I, yeah, I, I don't really, I haven't, I honestly, I haven't given this much thought when they poured the water out before the Lord, except that... Um, you know, water is a precious commodity, mm-hmm. and they were just giving up something for God, basically, mm-hmm. which is what a sacrifice is when you, you slay an animal and burn it. You know, you're not using it for yourself, so they're pouring it out and not using it for themselves. Okay, yeah. There were diverse washings back in the Old Testament, yeah. but um, I'm not, I can't, I, I don't think offhand of one where they poured out water for a sacrifice, but I don't know. I'll have to think about that. Okay. Turn over to 1 Peter 5 and verse 6, which is a good parallel text for that passage in James that we just read. 1 Peter 5 and verse 6. It says, Humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, that, ye may, that he may exalt you in due time. So the path to exaltation is humility. We tend to think just the opposite in our sinful nature. We tend to think, boast ourselves, brag about ourselves, everybody will see what a great guy we are, how capable we are, and then we'll be promoted, then we'll be lifted up. But the Bible says just the opposite. When you humble yourself, you'll be exalted. On the other hand, it says that pride goeth before destruction, and in haughty spirit before a fall. So pride is the opposite of humility, so if you, if you, um, I was going to say pride yourself, that's not, that's not grammatically correct, but anyway, if you become proud, you will be abased. If you become humble, you will be exalted, lifted up. And we're told in Proverbs 28 and verse 13 that they who confess their sins and forsake them will find mercy, which is exactly what Israel's doing back there. They're confessing their sins before the Lord. And as we will see here in just a minute, they will find mercy and be delivered from their enemies. Proverbs 28 and verse 13 it says, He that covereth his sins shall not prosper, but whoso confesseth and forsaketh them shall have mercy. Once again, every, most everything in the Bible is counterintuitive to the way that we think. What do we think when you sin? Well, don't confess it. Cover that thing up and hopefully nobody finds out about it, right? right. But the Bible teaches just the opposite. If you cover your sins, you won't prosper. But if you confess and forsake them, you'll have mercy. It works that way with God. It works that way with in, interpersonal relationship. If you've done something wrong, confess that sin or that, even if it wasn't technically a sin, maybe you just said something that wasn't nice or whatever, confess that to somebody and then you'll find mercy. Mm-hmm. And we saw also back there in 1 Samuel 7, 6, that they fasted as well. And if you turn over to Matthew 6, 16 through 18, we see that this is another key element to obtaining God's mercy and finding favor with Him is by afflicting our souls with fasting. 
you know, it was because a prophet named Daniel afflicted his soul and fasted that he got some of the most incredible prophecy in the whole Bible. Because it came after he fasted and then the angel appeared to him and gave him those revelations. I think you can find that in Daniel 8 if I remember right. But in Daniel 9, pardon me, I just had a note there. So, like I said, notes in your Bible, very valuable. Uh, Matthew 6, 16 through 18. Moreover, when you fast, be not as the hypocrites of a sad countenance, for they disfigure their faces, that they may appear unto men to fast. Verily I say unto you, they have their reward, and it's not a good one. You know, God rewards the wicked as well as the righteous. And it t the Bible talks about that. We think of a reward as a good thing that you're given for doing good. But God rewards the proud doer, it says, too. So everybody gets their, their reward, I guess you could say. But thou, when thou fastest, anoint thine head and wash thy face. In other words, clean yourself up. Don't make it look like you're in horrible affliction or something. Make yourself look like you're, you're just feeling fine even though inside you're really not. That thou appear not unto men to fast, but unto thy Father which is in secret, and thy Father which is in secret shall reward thee openly. Now, I'm sure, I hope you, I'm sure you've all done fasting, right? I preached on it, so you better have done it. But anyway, what do we all, what do we want to do when we're fasting? We want to tell everybody about it, right? Don't we? Don't we want to say, oh, I'm fasting. I'm so hungry right now. It's just killing me. I'm so weak. I can barely walk. I, you know, boy, I'm, you know, uh, this fasting is tough. That's what we always want to do, right? We want to tell everybody about it. But that Jesus says, do just the opposite. Make it look like, fake it till you make it, right? Make it look like you're not fasting. But God knows you're fasting. He sees it. And he that sees in secret will reward you openly. The Bible is so against our fallen nature. That's why, like it says in Psalm 119, Wherewith shall a young man cleanse his way by taking heed thereto according to thy law? I remember that verse. I can't remember the other 30-some that we memorized in that, in that chapter, but I can't even remember the verses for tonight, but I can remember that one anyway. That was according to thy word. I'll I'm check sure real quick. Yeah, I don't even think oh, you, you have that it. one memorized. Sorry. Such sticklers. <laughs> Well, basically, that is the that was the definition of fasting is not eating. So it, you could technically you could fast for a half a day or whatever the period of time you're fasting for. You're not eating during that time. So it might be a day. It could be a whole week if you so choose. Okay. So I personally recommend a whole day. I mean that yeah. that makes you that makes you feel it. You know, if you're only fasting between breakfast and lunch, it's not really a fast, right? Because you don't normally eat during that time anyway. And it doesn't count at night either, you know. Okay, that's well, why they call it breakfast, yeah. break the fast, right? That, so, so if I fast seven days in a week. I was, <laughs> yeah. I was thinking that was okay. I didn't yeah. want to talk about it. So, yeah. if, so if, you, if you fast for a whole day, you can't eat breakfast. You can't eat for that whole day until the next morning. Right, if you're going to do a whole day fast, yeah. Okay. Yeah. That's right. What I usually do, if I do it, is I'll have dinner one night, and then I don't eat again until the following, the morning on the, on the day after the next day. So basically I would eat one night, and then I would not eat breakfast, lunch, and dinner the next day, and then the next meal I would eat would be breakfast the following morning. So that's actually, that would be more than a, more than a 24 hour fast, but. Because, yeah, I, I mean, I guess the idea is not to kill yourself, but for me, just going to, to dinner the next day, I mean, I'm really, I'm hungry, but it, there's nothing like going to bed hungry. So, I mean, if you really want to afflict your soul, I, that's my suggestion anyway. But, you know, it's personal choice. All right, so let's go back to 1 Samuel 7, 7 through 8 again. But the second, if you ever do a two-day fast, the second day is by far the worst. If you think you're hungry at the end of the first day, try a two-day. Those things are brutal. Once you get past two, though, it's not so bad. You, your body goes into starvation mode, and you'd be surprised. You're not even, you're not really that hungry in the third day. But boy, the second day is miserable. Someone asked me this, I can't remember, I think we did, and I just thought of it now. When Jesus fasted for 30 days? 40. 40 days. 
He went without water as well, or was it just food? I don't know if it even, I'm not sure if it says, I know it says of Moses that he, I think it says that he ate no food or didn't drink water either. Yeah. I would assume, well, I don't know. I, I don't think it says, but I, it wouldn't surprise me since Moses was a type of Christ. And, that he would do the same. Yeah. And I think you can live that long. I mean, I don't think, I think some people think you can't live that long without water. I think there's it's, that idea out there. I don't think... I don't know, I mean, about Jesus. I, I don't think you can live that long without water. No, no three days. No, no, no. We watched a show. It was based on a true story, and these guys in World War II crashed a plane in the ocean. All they had was a life raft, oh, yeah. and there was 28 days before yeah, no, they were rescued. Uh, yeah, no, they would get rainwater and stuff. Oh, they did get rainwater. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But, I mean, that's very minuscule. You wouldn't think you could go 28 days. You can't go three days with completely no water. You can't feel that. I don't believe that. Yeah, that's a fact, so, I mean, you don't have to believe it. Well, you should do that and prove it to me. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) I don't know. I mean, it does say Jesus fasted for 40 days and 40 nights. I don't know if it doesn't say that he didn't drink specifically, so I don't know about that. But Moses did Mm -hmm. go without water. Let me just double-check that. Exodus 34, 28. I think it does say that. And he didn't die, so... I mean, that's... That's different, though. I'm talking about an average person. <laughs> average. Yeah. I don't know. Elijah was a man of like passions like uh, we are. With Peter, we just read that. Listen, you can't survive three days, just three or more days without water. We understand your position. Let's just yeah. see what God says. No, I'm not yeah. hating you. I really... And he, and he was there with the Lord 40 days and 40 nights. He did neither eat bread nor drink water. Speaking of Moses. There you go. So... What do you mean, you there know, you go? Did, that was miraculous. I would say that that was... That was more, you know, God sustaining him or something like that. And that could be. I mean, Don't you remember yeah. that one woman that was on life support that they took her off and they took her off of water and she lived for like three weeks? Remember that? Terry, yes, Terry, 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 Terry Shivo. No, no, no. What? Uh, Terry, yeah, Terry well, Shivo. Yeah, Terry yeah. Shivo yeah. died of starvation and dehydration and it took her three weeks and she started from a dilapidated state. Yeah. Jesus mm. and Moses started from a good, strong physical condition. Mm. So right there, I just and, say I know it's commonly taught and said, and chemistry teachers say it like it's a fact. But I've always found that fact suspicious. And d- did they not give Terry Shiva water? No, no, she they didn't no give her anything. Water. That, really? was, that, that was that was why there. it was so cruel. Yeah. Wow, that was the cruelty of it. Yeah. Is that she was. Dehydrating they took that her off the life support, and that's how they do it. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. But I don't know who would want to die that way, but if she did, I don't know. No, her husband mm. chose it. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> First Samuel 7, verses 7 through 8. What happened here? Sorry. Yeah, what does that... Oh, Israel was fasting, so I guess it was somewhat germane. But. First Samuel 7... 7 through 8. And when the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together at Mizpeh, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. And when the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. And the children of Israel said to Samuel, Cease not to cry unto the Lord our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. So, when the Philistines heard that Israel gathered together, they go up against them. And it says that Israel was afraid. Now, like I said, there's lots of parallels that we can pull out of this. Isn't it interesting that here Israel gathers together, so they're basically assembling, like they're a church. I mean, they are a church, right? They're assembling and they're confessing their sins. This is exactly what the devil does. He will do anything to keep us from assembling with the brethren and repenting and confessing of our sins. That's exactly his modus operandi. That's, he's always operated the same way, and that's exactly what he's doing here. But you notice that Israel, it says they were afraid, but this time they didn't let their faith overcome, or their fear overcome their faith. Sometimes they did. You know, when they were in the wilderness, they cried unto the Lord and said it'd be better if we'd have died in Egypt. And, you know, so, but this time they didn't. They go to Sam and they say, keep praying for us. Instead of going to Moses and complaining and blaming it on him and blaming God, they... Tell Samuel to keep praying. So Israel, then they ask him, like ask Samuel to keep praying, and he does, and we'll see what happens. 
So verse 9. And Samuel took a suckling lamb, or a sucking lamb and offered it for a burnt offering holy unto the Lord. And Samuel cried unto the Lord for Israel, and the Lord heard him. So Samuel offers this young lamb as a sacrifice, and God hears him. And we're told that God hears the prayers of the righteous. Right? He doesn't hear the prayers of the wicked, but he does hear the prayers of the righteous. And notice what Samuel does here. When he goes to the Lord, he takes a lamb and he offers it for an offering. Now, just think about this. Remember, we're looking for a New Testament church parallels, right? So Samuel got, sought God through the blood of the lamb. Does that, think it, does that bring anything to mind, maybe, that he's going to God through a lamb sacrifice? Well, that's exactly what, how we go to God. We go to God through Jesus Christ, who is the lamb of God. Let's look at um, Hebrews 10 and verse 19. See, this is a picture. Samuel is going to the Lord for salvation, right? He wants the Lord to save Israel out of the hand of their enemies. So he's going to the Lord for salvation through the blood of a lamb. Hebrews 10 and verse 19. This is why it was said when G- after Jesus resurrected from the dead and he met with some of those disciples, and it said that he expounded unto them all things in the law, in the Psalms, in the prophets concerning him. He's everywhere. Mm-hmm. There's a picture of him right here mm-hmm. in Second or in First Samuel 7. And it's all through the Bible. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 19. It says, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus... So, like we enter into the holiest when we pray to God through Jesus Christ, through his blood. Likewise, here's a type and a shadow of that. Samuel offering a lamb, the blood of a lamb, and he has access to God to get um, access to God's deliverance through this shed blood of a lamb. Mm -hmm. Hebrews 7 and verse 25. It says, Wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. This is speaking of Jesus. So he can save to the uttermost. When we, come to, when we come to God through Jesus Christ, Jesus makes intercession for us, which means he goes between us and God, and he can save to the uttermost. And this is exactly what God is going to do for Israel when Samuel goes to him. We know that Jesus Christ is called the Lamb of God. Remember John 1 and verse 29 when uh, John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. And we're told in Romans 10 and verse 13 that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Romans 10 and verse 13. Most people completely take this verse out of context and think it's talking about getting eternal life or something. But... This verse and other verses like it and places where it's being quoted from shows us that this is speaking of a deliverance from God, not necessarily an eternal deliverance or something, but it can refer to any type of deliverance. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. In this case, the deliverance is salvation from ignorance and salvation from trying to save yourself from works-based salvation. It's a salvation from a false version of salvation, basically. That's exactly what, what Paul says there in Romans 10, that Israel has a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. They're ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness. They haven't submitted themselves under the righteousness of God. So when they confess Christ, then they're saved from their ignorance and they're saved from trying to save themselves by keeping the law. But I got a couple more verses for you to show that when you call unto God, he will save you. Look at Psalm 116. Verses 4 and 8. Psalm 116, 4 and 8. It says, Then called I upon the name of the Lord, O Lord, I beseech thee, deliver my soul. And verse 8, For thou hast delivered my soul from death, mine eyes from tears, and my feet from falling. Remember, deliver is a synonym of save. Deliverance is a synonym of salvation. And we know that if you look in in the book of Joel, it says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be delivered. 
And when Paul is quoting that and Peter is quoting that, they say he shall be saved. So we see that saved and delivered mean the same thing. And here you see that there is salvation from many different things. Thou hast delivered, or we could say saved, my soul from death, there's one thing. Mine eyes from tears and my feet from falling. There's three different things that David was saved from. I think this is David. Well, it doesn't say it was David, but it probably was David. Most of the Psalms are. Also, look at Psalm 107. There's a few verses here. We'll do verses, verse six, verses 6, 13, and then 23 through 30. This whole psalm is about God saving people who cry unto him in time of trouble. Psalm 107, verses 6 and 13. It says, Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them out of their distresses. It's exactly what Israel's doing here. Samuel's calling unto the Lord, and he's about ready to deliver them out of their distresses because the Philistines are coming against them. Verse 13. Then they cried unto the Lord in their trouble, and he saved them out of their distresses. Now let's read verse, verses 23 through 30. It says, They that go down to the sea in ships, that do business in great waters, these see the works of the Lord and his wonders in the deep. For he commandeth and raiseth the stormy wind, which lifteth up the waves thereof. They mount up to the heaven, they go down again to the depths. Their soul is melted because of trouble. They reel to and fro and stagger like a drunken man and are at their wit's end. Then they cry unto the Lord in their trouble and he bringeth them out of their distresses. Isn't this pretty much what we all do? We get to our wit's end and then we think, oh, I should pray. Right? How many times? How many times have you been going through some terrible affliction or something and wondering what to do and then it finally dawns on you after you've been suffering this thing forever that, well, maybe I should actually pray about it. You know, isn't that what happens? Verse 29. He maketh the, the storm a calm, so that the waves thereof are still. Then are they glad, because they be quiet, so he bringeth them unto their desired haven. You can just imagine when you read that description of, of the seafaring men being in a storm and I've never been out at sea in a, in a big ship or anything but you know, I'm sure we've all seen movies about what that's like and with the waves coming in over the, the ship and, and it you know up and down and up and down and I mean I just can't even imagine what that must have been like but anyway they cry to the Lord and he delivers them out of their distresses he makes the storm a calm and that's there's another picture of Jesus Christ right because that's what he did for his disciples too and that's what it'll do for you, spiritually speaking. When your life is a mess, when your life is a big storm, right? Call unto the Lord. He'll bring you quietness and peace. Let's go back to 1 Samuel 7 and verse 10. First Samuel 7 and verse 10. It says, And as Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But the Lord thundered with a great thunder on that day upon the Philistines and discomfited them, and they were smitten before Israel. So this is interesting. So while Samuel's in the middle of making this offering, the Lord destroys the Philistines before Israel. So he hadn't even finished yet. And this brings some things to mind. Number one, Jesus said that God knows what we need for before we even ask. God knew they needed deliverance from the Philistines. He just wanted to make sure, he at least waits until Samuel starts, just to make sure to prove his faith, to see if he'll do it or not. And that's what the Lord requires of us sometimes, to take that first step. We might not know how it's going to turn out. How many of us, I'll get to you in just a second, how many of us, whenever we were first ready to get baptized, especially a lot of us, it was a long ways away, it wasn't just you know church down the street or something, I mean, this is a major life decision, right? And you often wonder what's going to happen, you know, how, how is this all going to work out? Well, you take that first step, and then the Lord steps in, and he brings you to your desired haven, as it were. Yeah. You had a question, Maddie. Yeah, I don't understand, though, but as it just gets thrown out, God already knows what's going to go on. Mm-hmm. He already knows what's going to go Yep, that's right. We probably want to think he wants to see if you really, if you trust him and if you believe in him. Well, 
Well, he already knows that he will do it or will not do mm -hmm. it. But there's a sense in which that God, when he deals with us, he deals in time. So God is eternal, and he knows everything, the end from the beginning. But when he deals with us, we're down here in time. So it's as if God allows himself to be bound by time when he deals with us and treats us as such. Because otherwise, if you think about it, if God only treated us in his eternal, infinite mind, I mean, there, there would be no waiting for us to ask or anything like that because it's already done in his mind. So he, he enters into time, if you will, and deals with us where we are. Okay. Best explanation I can give you anyway. Look so at Matthew. You, pet dog, yeah. you deal with it as a dog. Yeah. You would mm -hmm. deal with it as you would a friend, a brother, or sister. Yeah. So you pet it and deal mm -hmm. with it in doggy terms. Yeah. yeah. Or your little brothers and sisters when they're little, you wouldn't deal with them the same way that you would deal with your bigger brother. Yeah. Right? You would talk to them differently and you know, at a level that they can understand. Mm -hmm. Look at Matthew six and verse eight. We'll see here that the Lord knows what we're going to ask before we even ask it. But he still wants you to ask. So you can say no or yes. Yeah, well, yeah, that's true. And so that he can get the satisfaction of helping you out. If he just did it all for you, then he, there wouldn't be much satisfaction for the Lord. But if he waits till you ask, and then he gives you what you really long for, and what you're really, if he, especially if he lets you suffer for a little while, and then you're really crying out, you're really begging for it, and then he can give it to you, and he can save you out of your troubles, he gets a lot of glory. Because All then what do you do? Can relate to that. Of course, yeah. The pastor can relate to that because July is coming up. <laughs> <laughs> Amen. I had a thought, and it just escaped me. Oh, anyway. Just because I interrupted. That's, that's all right. Um, ah, I hate it when that happens. It'll probably come to me. Uh, Matthew 6 and verse 8. It says, Be not ye therefore like unto them. He's talking about the heathen that use these vain repetitions. For your father knoweth what things ye have need of before ye ask him. But then he goes on and teaches them how to pray. He teaches them the Lord's Prayer, which one of the things that he teaches them to pray for is, give us this day our daily bread. He knows what you're going to ask for, but he wants to hear you ask anyway. And this is an excellent cross-reference text for this verse in second in 1 Samuel 7. The Lord answers before we call. Look at Isaiah 65 and verse 24. Isaiah 65 and verse 24. It says, And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. Now, if I don't have a note made there, I, I definitely need to remember to put a note next to 1 Samuel 7 and verse 9, because or verse 10, because that is exactly what's happening. Samuel's in the middle of offering the sacrifice and praying unto the Lord, and the Lord destroys the Philistines. He answers before the the asking was even finished. Do you have a note there? I don't know. I should probably check. Let's see. I thought you were saying that this is even. Well, I don't know if I... I don't know. I, I should make a note. You know what? Let me just grab my pen. Because I don't want to forget that. But see, the thing is, you don't make a note right now because then you write it sloppily. But what you do is you just see so you circle 1 Samuel 7:10, and then you circle Isaiah 65:24, and then draw an arrow between the two of them, and then you know. That's what I used to do back when I was sitting in the pews. I, when I was listening to the sermons, I would just circle verses, put arrows between them, and then I would go home afterwards and I would put the notes in the Bible. So I didn't end up with a bunch of spurious notes in my Bible, you know, <laughs> yeah, and then regret it for the rest of my life. And then blame it on somebody else as if it's their fault or something. But the thing is about God, he loves these 11th hour victories, right? He waits right until the end. I mean, the, the Philistines are coming upon them. Israel's afraid. They're asking Samuel to pray. The Lord could have destroyed the Philistines before they even left the camp, right? But he waits right until the end because he wants to get the glory. He wants to make sure that they know 
that it was the Lord that saved him. That's what he wants. And furthermore, this is the thought that I had that I forgot. He knows that if he waits until the 11th hour and you pray and he delivers you, what are you more than likely going to do, or at least what should you do? Thank the Lord, give him the praise, and he gets all the praise and the glory for it. We're told in 1 Corinthians 10.13 that the Lord will not allow us to be tempted above that we are able, but will with the temptation make a way of escape that we may be able to bear it. 1 Corinthians 10.13 says, There hath no temptation taken you but such as is common to man, but God is faithful, who will not suffer you to be tempted above that ye are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that ye may be able to bear it. And this is what God does for Israel here. He lets them be tempted right up until close to the line that they're able. I mean, the Philistines are coming after us. We're about ready to, to get taken over here. And then he steps in and he makes a way of escape. Mm-hmm. And the way of escape was through the prophet praying for them and then the Lord delivering them. Let's go back to verse 7. 1 Samuel 7 and verse 11. First Samuel 7 and verse 11. It says, And the men of Israel went out of Mizpeh and pursued the Philistines and smote them until they came under Bethkar. So, the Lord, it says there in verse 10 that the Lord destroyed the Philistines. Does it not? It says, The Lord discomfited them. So the Lord destroys them, but then Israel goes and they pursue them and they sort of clean up the mess and they finish the job. So God had done the hard work. He'd done the the major, I mean, he'd really decimated them pretty well. And then there's a few stragglers left over, stragglers left over that Israel goes out and that they uh, finish the job. So God does his part and then Israel does their part. But Israel would have never been able to do their part had God not first done his part. Now, think about a New Testament Christian parallel to this. It says, it tells us in the book of Philippians, and we'll turn there in just a second, Philippians 2. It says that um, God first works in us to will and to do of his good pleasure. And then we are supposed to work out our salvation. So God does the working in first. God regenerates the heart. He gives the new spirit. He puts his law onto the mind and onto the heart and gives us the ability to, to live a Christian life, and then we work out that salvation that God has worked in already. This is exactly what God's doing back there, in a sense. God delivers them, he works in the salvation, if you will, and then they're going to work it out where they go and finish the job. But we don't finish the job of eternal salvation. The eternal salvation is God working it into us to do the will and to, to will and to do his good pleasure, and us working it out is our temporal salvation when we come into fellowship with God. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Philippians 2, 12 through 13. Wherefore, my beloved, as ye have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. And get this. For it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. I was talking to a Presbyterian preacher one time years ago when I was in the process of being converted and talking to him about election. And I think I I wanted to know if he believed in regeneration before conversion, before belief. And most of those guys don't. And and I think he said it was simultaneous or something like that. And he says, well, you know, the Bible does say we have to work out our own salvation. I didn't know it well enough to know, to tell him to read the next verse. But the next verse says, for it is God which worketh in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So... Whatever you're working out is something that there's already been the change of the heart. The Lord has already regenerated you. A good parallel text for that is Ephesians 2, verse 10. Ephesians 2.10 says, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. So this being created in Christ Jesus is the new birth. We, it says we are a new creature, a new creation, right? God makes us new. He gives us a new spirit within us. 
And when he does that, he does it for the purpose that we should do the good works which he has before ordained that we should walk in them. So God, before he ever regenerated you, has all these good works that he wants you to do, but you can't do any of the good works until you have a new spirit within you. So he regenerates you, he gives you that new spirit, writes a law in your heart, and then he gives you his Bible, which tells you all the good works that he wants you to do. And then you work out that salvation that he's worked into you. Let's go back to verse 12. 1 Samuel 7 and verse 12. So here, in a sense, Israel is working out their salvation. The salvation was God destroying their enemies and saving them from their enemies. Now they're working out that salvation and they're going and and getting rid of all the extraneous garbage in their lives, so to speak, right? They're, They're cleaning up the rest of the mess that we still have that flesh hanging on to us, you know? So that's, that's how, that's how it works. It's like with Lazarus, when Jesus says Lazarus comes forth, Lazarus resurrects from the dead and comes out, and then he tells the disciples, take the grave clothes off of them, right? So it's, it's that old picture with the eternal and then the temporal following it afterwards. Mm-hmm. First Samuel 7 and verse 12. should have brought myself a bookmark so I didn't have to keep flipping back here. It says, Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpeh and Shen, and called the name of it Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. And this is where the title of the sermon comes from, God our Ebenezer. So when God saves them, then God, then Samuel sets up a stone as a memorial for that. And that's typical back in the Bible. You remember when, when Israel came out of uh, the land of Egypt, and then they went through the, the wilderness, and when they came across the Jordan River, they took 12 stones and they built themselves an altar after they got across Jordan when they went into the land of Canaan. And um, this, this, there were other times as well whenever a, a, an altar or something would be built to remember a certain thing. Jacob and Bethel. Bethel set up the stones and this, this is the house of God. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's right. So they commemorate the victory by setting up a stone and they call it Ebenezer. And usually names in the Bible mean something, right? The name Ebenezer, according to my center column reference anyway, means the stone of help. And you can pretty much figure that out from the text itself. Actually, you don't even need to know Hebrew or anything, because look what it says. Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shen and called the name of Ebenezer, saying, Hitherto hath the Lord helped us. The stone of help, right? So you can figure it out without even having a concordance or anything. And that goes back to our old hymn. Um, hither by my Ebenezer. Uh, here I raise my, my Ebenezer. Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I'll come. Right. Yep. Maybe we'll sing that after the Bible study. Now, we want to look at the New Testament parallels, right? Well, Jesus is our Ebenezer. He's a stone, right? He's the chief cornerstone on which the church is built. And he helps us. Hitherto hath the Lord helped us, help us. Look at Ephesians 2 and verse 20. We'll see here that Jesus is a stone. He refers to himself as a stone numerous times. He said, Whosoever this stone falls upon, it will grind him into powder. Talking to the Pharisees. He said, Upon this rock will I build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Talking about himself. Ephesians 2 and verse 20. It says, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. So he's the stone of help on which the church is built. He's the foundation. And he helps us. Look at, a, at uh, Hebrews 4 and verse 15 through 16. Hebrews 4, 15 through 16. For we have not an high priest, which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us, therefore, come boldly under the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is our stone of help, right? In other words, he's our Ebenezer. Let's go back to verse 13, 1 Samuel 7, 13. 
So they call upon the name of the Lord. The Lord saves him, saves them from their enemies. And they set up this stone to memorialize that great salvation. Do we have a something to set up a memorial to remember the great salvation that Jesus made for us? How about communion? We do it every one, every week, right? Or every month. 1 Samuel 7 and verse 13. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more into the coast of Israel, and the hand of the Lord was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. So as long as Samuel lived, the Philistines didn't give Israel any more trouble. And that often happens. And it happened during, I mean, the, the whole book of Judges is a story after that you know, that repeats over and over again. Israel will be in trouble. They'll call on the Lord to be saved out of their distresses, to be saved from their enemies. God raises up a judge. The judge delivers them. And all the years of that judge, everything's fine. And then as soon as that judge dies, then they go back in their old ways. And, and then it's, you know, wash, rinse, and repeat. You know, the whole thing just goes over and over again. If you turn to Jeremiah 5 and verse 1, I'll just give you one example here in the scripture of having a godly person around can save people. And there's plenty of examples of that, like Abraham. You know, Abraham was around and, and Lot was saved from uh, the Sodom, first from when he got taken over by the Sodomites, and then he was saved from Sodom and Gomorrah before they, got, they were destroyed. Um, I had another thought, which I... Just forgot about. But there are, Job was another example where his friends were spared because of him and so on. But anyway, turn with me to Jeremiah 5 and verse 1. Jeremiah 5 and verse 1 says, Run ye to and fro through the streets of, it, of Jerusalem, and see now, and know, and seek in the broad places thereof, if ye can find a man, just one, if there be any that executeth judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I will pardon it. God says, run through the whole city of Jerusalem. If you can find one guy that executes judgments and, how's it say, and seeks the truth, he'll pardon the whole city for one guy that seeks the truth. Obviously, Israel was in pretty bad shape at this time. When the Lord takes it down to one guy, you know, in Sodom and Gomorrah, it was ten, right? Abraham got him down to ten. The Lord, he would have spared the city for ten. But in this case, he would spare Jerusalem just for one guy. So like I said in the sermon the other day, keep the faith. You know, Minneapolis, Minnesota, the United States may be depending on you. You never absolutely, know. Absolutely. So keep the faith. That's the best thing you can do mm-hmm. to protect yourself from a nuclear holocaust. That's right. Verse 14. And then people who kill godly men do so at their own demise. They yes. think they're getting rid of an evil and they're bringing evil upon them. Boy, it wasn't wasn't Jesus Christ the ultimate example of that. Amen. <laughs> you know, they think they're putting to death Jesus Christ as troublemaker, and they're going to be saved from the Romans if they, they do it. Their you know, place. yeah, and the yeah, exact they opposite. Their place already. Oh boy. Oh. All right, First Samuel seven fourteen, in the cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel and Ekron, even unto Gath, and the coast thereof did Israel deliver out of the hands of the Philistines, and there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Now this is interesting. So first of all, God gives back to Israel all the cities and the coast which the Philistines had taken, and he gave them peace. So they got back everything that they had lost. So when we turn to the Lord, he'll give you back whatever you lost. You know, it says in, um, this just came to mind, in Luke 18, it's, it's said in three different Gospels, but one of the places in it is in Luke 18. Matthew 19 is another one. But I think Luke's the one that I want. Where it says, And he said unto them, Verily, uh, verse 29, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, There is no man that hath left house, or parents, or brethren, or wife, or children, or uh, or children for the kingdom of God's sake, who shall not receive manifold more in this present time and in the world to come, life everlasting. So if you have to give things up to follow the Lord, he'll give it back to you, and more so. So God gave them back all the land that the Philistines had taken, and he gave them peace. 
You know, we're told in Proverbs 16 and verse 7 that when a, man, when a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. Well, we could say when a nation's ways please the Lord, he maketh even their enemies to be at peace with him. Uh, Proverbs 16 and verse 7 it says, When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And this is what happened in Israel. Their ways pleased the Lord. They turned from Balaam. They turned from Ashtoreth. They served the Lord only. They humbled themselves. They confessed their sins. They fasted. Their ways pleased the Lord. And he makes their enemies be at peace with them. Because what does it say there? He made peace between them and, uh, was it the Amorites? Let me go back there. First Samuel 7. I forget. If Amorites. It, Amorites. So their ways pleased the Lord and he brings them at peace. And the thing was, it seems like this is was uh, kind of like a, um, a not how do I want to say it a um, like a side blessing or something a um, what's the word I'm looking for I hate that when that happens or residual or um, side effect or something something like that anyway unintended where consequence. unintended consequence yeah they because they I don't it doesn't even mention the Amorites prior to this anyway so not only did he did he save them from the Philistines but then he makes them at peace with another one of their neighbors. This happened to Israel under the reign of God the King Jehoshaphat. If you look in 2 Chronicles 17, 3 through 6, and then 10 through 11. 2 Chronicles 17, 3 through 6, and 10 through 11. It says, And the Lord was with Jehoshaphat because he walked in the first ways of his father David and sought not unto Balaam. Sound familiar? Israel turns away from Balaam. The Lord delivers them, saves them from their enemies. Verse 4, But sought to the Lord God of his father, and walked in his commandments, and not after the doings of Israel. Therefore the Lord established the kingdom in his hand, and all Judah brought unto Jehoshaphat presents, and he had riches and honor in abundance. And his heart was lifted up in the ways of the Lord. Moreover, he took away the high places and groves out of Judah. So Jehoshaphat's doing the right thing. He's turned from Balaam. He's turned from the, the wickedness of Israel. And he's taken away the high places and the groves. And groves, talk about going back to Christmas, the groves were groves of green trees where they worshipped. So he's doing away with Balaam, or Baal, the sun god, and the tree worship. He's getting rid of Christmas, Christmas trees, yes. Look at verse 10 through 11. And the fear of the Lord fell upon all the kingdoms of the lands that were round about Judah, so that they made no war against Jehoshaphat. He gives them peace with their enemies, because Jehoshaphat's ways pleased the Lord. Also, some of the Philistines brought Jehoshaphat presents and tribute silver, and the Arabians brought him flocks, 7,000 and 700 rams, and 7,000 and 700 goats. When a man's ways please the Lord, he maketh even his enemies to be at peace with him. And notice what it said there of Israel, there in 1 Samuel 7, in verse 14, that they had peace. Get the exact verse. 1 Samuel 7 and verse 14. It says, And there was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Well, we're told in Isaiah 32... 17 through 18, that the work of righteousness or the effect of righteousness is peace and quietness. Isaiah 32, 17 through 18. Isaiah 32, 17 through 18. And the work of righteousness shall be peace, and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance forever. And my people shall dwell in a peaceable habitation, and in, and in sure dwellings, and in quiet resting places. The work of righteousness shall be peace and the effect of righteousness, quietness and assurance. You know, if you do righteousness, for instance, God's word tells you to, when your children are disobe disobedient, you chasten them, right? And it says when you chasten your son, he will give thee rest. Yes. So the work of righteousness is peace and quietness. And I'm sure you've all seen that, right? The kids are screaming and throwing a fit. And you do righteousness, and then there's peace and quiet, right? Yeah. Let's go back to verse 15 and 15 through 17. 
And we'll sum up the end of this chapter. It says, And Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life, and he went from year to year in circuit unto Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpeh, and judged Israel in all those places. And his return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and there he built an altar unto the Lord. So Samuel spends the rest of his life in Israel as a judge and as a circuit riding preacher. Yeah. Basically, that's what it says there. He, yep, three he, three, one. yep, three churches, and it says he went in circuit. He went year to year in circuit. So the old circuit riding preachers were not the first ones to do it. Samuel had been doing this for thousands of years before they had. Down to so, Missouri and back up to Minneapolis. Yeah. Yep, at least I don't have to ride a horse anymore. You know, I'm at least driving a car, so that's better. Although your car, I mean, some might prefer a horse to the car you drive. I don't know. <laughs> Actually, it's in the shop right now, as a matter of fact. Yeah. Believe it or not, it's, it was in pretty good shape. The air conditioning has gone out of it. and So anyway, I they had... I'll tell you about it later. Is it chip? Oh, it shifts, yeah. Air, air conditioner, not the transmission. No, I know, but yeah. I don't think that it shifts right. It oh, it, sh- it shifts okay, yeah. Can anyone drive your car or just you? Well, <laughs> anybody can drive it. I'm not sure how long it would last if somebody else was driving it. The clutch slips a little bit, so it's slips, yeah. it's certain times. No. But, yeah, I'll tell you about it. So 1 Samuel 7 is a beautiful story of how God, our Ebenezer, will save his people from their enemies and their troubles and give them peace when they turn from their sins and idolatry and serve him with an humble heart. So we can learn all kinds of lessons from this. Turn away from our pagan ways, from celebrating these pagan holidays, Christmas and Easter. Turn to the Lord, repent, do some fasting, pray, have the righteous pray for you, turn to God and believe that he'll save you instead of you know, let, don't let fear overcome your faith. And watch God save in the 11th hour, and then he gives you peace and quietness. And isn't that 